Let's start with the hostage situation and this discussion about whether or not Israel was going to send the head of Mossad uh, to, to Qatar. This is a tricky one because it's not clear whether what Hamas is interested in doing vis-a-vis -vis further hostage negotiations. Uh, it may be actually clearer what at least some of the hardline ministers in the Israeli government uh, are interested in doing. What's your sense of this? Yeah, I think you're right. And the fissures that we're seeing are at least as many intra-Israeli as between Israel and the United States in this respect. The White House has been very clear and has managed to also transmit very clearly its commitment to do everything possible to get the hostages out. Whereas in Israel, you have some of Netanyahu's most powerful and also most extremist ministers basically saying, you know what, this is a war we're fighting and the hostages are not going to impede our prosecution of this war. That's the reason that these hostage families who really are sinking into worse and worse desperation as the days tick up to around 70, um, they feel that they are being shunted around and they feel that they're possibly becoming the victims of um, a fight between kind of Netanyahu's better angels, let's say, or his need to respond to public pressure versus his really most extremist ministers who simply don't care. No, it's interesting because uh, Joe Biden has been strongly supportive of Israel literally since day one. I know when I was uh, there, I, I heard people sort of jokingly saying Joe Biden is the best prime minister uh, Israel's ever had. But this growing uh, fissure between Biden and, and Netanyahu comes at a time that Netanyahu uh, is talking about uh, a, a campaign. And he he's sort of putting forward this idea that I'm the one who can push back on Joe Biden. No one else will be able to do it as well as I can. That's right. And this is Netanyahu reverting to a pretty old M.O. of his, in which he thinks that he can convince Israelis to uh, increase their support for him by saying, I'm the only international face you've got. I'm the only one who speaks English like a native. I know Joe Biden for more than 40 years. Let me handle this. It's unclear whether Israelis are going to fall for this again the way they have fallen for it in the past. But what's interesting is that Israel is very much at war. The names of the dead on the Israeli side also are adding up every single day. Both new names added to the tally of the people who were killed on the original day, October 7th, and hostages being killed in Gaza, and soldiers now being killed every single day in battle. And Israelis are really still deep in that reality, this post-October 7th reality of a terrible mm -hmm. new world. Because Netanyahu has gotten up, dusted himself off, and he is happily now trying to run for an election that hasn't yet been called. But clearly, he feels pressure to kind of up his numbers from around 27%. Let's talk a little about that, because there are a lot of people who speculate that Netanyahu will not be able to hold on to his prime ministership uh, after this war is settled, whenever that may be. Um, Netanyahu uh, is, is like a handful of other leaders in the world who, to whom holding office is a prevention mechanism from being prosecuted. Uh, what, what, is, what is Israeli society thinking about that? Because you and I have been talking for the last year in which Israeli society was... Uh, very frustrated with, with Netanyahu and, and, and that type of behavior. Right. Netanyahu's even in a slightly trickier situation because his efforts to overhaul Israel and turn it into an authoritarian state where he could, in theory, cancel his own trial were stalled. As you just mentioned, for the past year, Netanyahu attempted to push what he was calling a judicial reform and Israelis per perceived as a coup d'etat. Uh, by the way, Joe Biden was loudly critical of that during the entire period and returned often to the concept of the shared values that Israel and the United States had to keep uh, preserving. So what we see now is Netanyahu's actually on trial. He's prosecuting this war. His trial has renewed. His lawyers are trying to push, you know, back uh, the the number of uh, session, weekly sessions of the trial, push back the date of the restart of the trial, pushing, pushing, pushing. But the fact of the matter, he is in power, and he would like to stay in power so that he can try to return 
to those coup d'etat legislative efforts and then maybe still be able to cancel his trial. That is clearly still on the agenda. His justice minister isn't hiding it. He's refused to convene the Judicial Appointments Committee. He's trying to really kind of freeze that whole process. But we don't know when this um, war will be over or what Netanyahu will consider it. And I think that that's the number one issue being discussed right now with the United States here in Jerusalem, which is, when are you going to say this is over? When is this daily right. grind of war? And what can we install afterwards? I want to go back to, I was in uh, Uvalde right after the shooting, and, and I remember speaking to a number of people um, about how you solve this problem in Texas. Texas is tricky because even, uh, this is not, it doesn't break on Democratic-Republican lines uh, as it relates to gun ownership the way it does in, in some northern states. It's, it's a tricky one. And you have tried and suggested numerous ways in which Texas can handle this issue. But really, in the wake of Uvalde, it became easier to own a gun in Texas. Well, you're right, uh, Ali. I mean, the fact is Texas is broken. It's broken on so many issues. It's broken on, on guns and gun violence. It's broken on women's reproductive rights issues. You know, we don't, uh, Ted Cruz didn't break everything that's wrong in Texas, but he certainly embodies it all. Um, we somehow live in a state where someone can walk down the street with an AR-15 with impunity and not be stopped by law mm -hmm. enforcement officers. We're living in a state where we have the most mass shootings of any state in the last two years. Uh, we are certainly, certainly ailing in this issue, and the solutions are right there in front of us. Even Republican voters want to see an age limit increase. They want to see universal background checks, and they want to see extreme risk protective orders. And fundamentally, we should be talking about an assault weapons ban in this country. Look, it's one thing to talk about gun violence, and it's another thing to go in and see all of those dead children. I had to sue the state. Uh -huh. I saw every bit of that carnage, and I saw all of those children lying on the floor, some of them unidentifiable. We have to change what's broken in this in this state. What what's what does popular sentiment around this issue look like? Again, it's it's easy for some people to think of this as black and white, yes and no, gun rights versus uh, gun control. It's complicated in in Texas. What what looks like success to you with respect to to gun violence in Texas? Well, I think success, Ali, has to start with getting rid of Ted Cruz, who doesn't even want to talk about this issue. Uh, and if people are frustrated, they can go to RolandForTexas.com and look at the solutions that we have going forward. But success could mean having an age limit increase to 21. Most Republicans in the state are in favor of that. Success could be an extreme risk protective orders. And Republicans are coming around on red flags because they know that they don't want a mentally ill person to access weapons. And uh, we should have the power to be able to take those away when they're making threats. And certainly universal background checks. And that said, I don't shirk from the most important thing that we that we like to talk about, which is an assault weapons ban. Uh, I don't wish anybody to see those pictures and those images, but sometimes I wonder, what, what, would it change things if Americans saw what happened to those poor babies? Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about Senator Cruz not wanting to answer questions on this. Obviously, one of the reasons we don't talk about the gun issue in Texas uh, is because for the last year, other than the period around Uvalde, we have been preoccupied with the reproductive rights issue in Texas because Texas is is leading the country in its uh, in, its, in the draconian, not just the laws, but the actual way that it's playing out. Uh, your colleague, Ted Cruz, uh, not your colleague, the, the person you're, you're hoping to run against, Ted Cruz, um, are, is avoiding questions about Kate Cox, the woman who has now had to leave your state to seek reproductive uh, care. Th these are both yeah. issues that are sort of top of mind for most Texans right now. For most Texans, Republicans and Democrats, let's be very clear. I mean, you're right. He doesn't want to answer any things on guns. He wants to think about it and pray about it with people, and that's the end of that, uh, with no real solutions. When it comes to reproductive rights, he wants us all to go talk to his press secretary. The fact is, you know, this poor woman, Kate Cox, who was on the verge of 
uh, a, a tremendous implication with her pregnancy and problem that she was having, uh, could have died from it, uh, certainly was put in this situation and had to leave Texas after being attacked by the attorney general, being attacked by Ted Cruz, being attacked by the Supreme Court of Texas. Republican men in this state have just wrought havoc on women and, on, and their reproductive choices. We have to be able to go at a federal level and codify Roe v. Wade, possibly expand the Supreme Court, and certainly change the filibuster on the issues that are most important to us, like gun violence, like reproductive rights, like electoral laws, the things that the vast majority of, me of Americans are in favor of. Christine, you and I ruminate on this topic a lot. Uh, what's the disconnect yeah. between 3.7% unemployment, inflation 3.1% is largely where people think yeah. inflation can exist. What's going on between what's, what, what's happening and what people are saying they feel? Ali, I think those inflation scars are really, really deep, and it will take a lot of time to heal those wounds. And I think that's what the Treasury Secretary was was sort of suggesting, that over time, people are going to realize that the worst of the inflation is behind us and that things are getting better. That inflation, that inflation situation was was pretty scary coming out of the uh, coming out of the pandemic. I also think that you and I, econo nerds like you and I, we talk about inflation rates, but Americans talk about price levels. And so a 3.1% yeah. inflation rate is on type right is on top of a 7% inflation in November last year. That's 10% if you add those two together, right? Just for back of the envelope math. So people are still paying more for their grocery bill today than they were 2 or 3 years ago and they know that. Christine, let me ask you about this. I know you think about this a lot. How much uh, of inflation is real because wages are up, people earn more money, um, employers have to pay more money to get their employees. That's sort of a real thing. And over time, that levels out. And then there's this thing where, where people say some companies raise prices because in an inflationary uh, environment, that's what consumers think is going to happen. And, and, and maybe they're profiteering from that a little bit. What do you, what do you think of that analysis? Yeah, you're talking, you're talking about that greed, greedflation, I think, is what, is what progressives call it. And yeah. companies when you talk to them, you know, they say their in inputs are going up, too. So they're raising prices because their inputs are going up. But when you look at corporate profits, corporate profits have been pretty good this year, right? So profits have still been good, and they've been passing along uh, price increases. So I don't know how much the so-called greedflation um, fits into the whole thing. I do know that, you know, a big chunk of inflation is shelter costs. It's, it's the cost of housing, and that's been really, really tough to turn the curve on. And Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, yesterday said they think that those are going to start to come down. The shelter costs will start to come down next year. The Fed chief said the same thing. It takes a long time to turn, you know, to turn sort of uh, of that chart. And they're hoping that that, but shelter has been a real big part of the problem. And Ali, you know, you can switch which cuts, cuts of meat you buy at the grocery store if you're trying to, you know, manage inflation in your grocery bill. You can't change where you live overnight. And so that's why that part of the inflation yeah. story has been really troubling. What about the idea that there are countries, particularly Northern Europe, where wages are high, higher than they are, let's say, for the average American, and over time costs go up too, but they don't feel it as much. When you go to Oslo, Norway, everything's expensive, mm. but people earn well and they've got health care and their education is paid for, so they generally feel better about higher, wa uh, higher wages. Is, is that something that's going to happen to us over time, where our wages will go up or prices will go up, but we'll resettle at a higher level? I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's hard to make that comparison because you have, for example, the United States. One of the reasons why I think so many people say they don't feel good about the economy is because you can't get daycare. You can't get a babysitter. You know, you have, I think, I don't know, 20 mm percent -hmm. fewer people in the daycare, in the, in the, in the child care industry than you had yep. before the pandemic. Right. It's expensive. Child care is more than the same as the cost of going to a public college in a lot of states. It's real. So there are these things about the American economy that bother people that are still just it's friction in in your day to day life and going back to work. And I think that is one of the reasons why these sentiment polls have been so consistently negative about how people feel about the economy. I've been calling it the sourpuss economy. I'll say to people, look at all these things that are going right. And they just give me a funny face. You know, they don't they don't feel it. And so I think that's something that maybe time will heal. But the Fed certainly thinks that, Allie, that they've got this right. I mean, they're not declaring, de declaring victory on, on inflation yet, but um, it, all the ingredients of a soft landing is what the Fed chief 
O'Keefe was was uh, was uh, trumpeting yesterday. So we've got record numbers in stock markets. We've got the Dow at the highest level it's ever been, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500. If you've got a 401k, that'll be reflected in the, the, these yeah. numbers. But the other number that I think you and I would agree is substantially more important is the unemployment rate at 3.7 percent. How many years did you and I uh, believe that 5 percent was full, un full employment, right? That, that yeah. there's always going to be 5 percent of the society who's in flux and moving around. 3.7 percent. That's tell me what you make of that. That's on one hand great because it's causing wages to go up. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's it's a. Uh, in some places, a severe labor shortage. When you talk about why people can't get child yeah. care or, or, or care at their home, it's because those people are doing something else that pays more money. Yeah. And in some cases, why more women aren't working more hours at their job because uh, they can't get the child care that they need. Look, that unemployment rate is is just spectacular. I mean, it really is. There are 8 million open jobs in America right now, way more open jobs than people who are looking um, looking for work. And, and the other thing is the Fed in its sort of forecast alley for next year, I mean, it sees the economy slowing. It sees the jobless rate rising to a whopping 4.1 percent, which is still historically wow. low, which is still historically low. So the Fed thinks it can achieve uh, this price stability, which is looking for a 2 percent sort of price growth in the economy and not kill the job market in, in the process. And I sure hope they're right. I sure hope they're right for all of our sakes. Um, but, you know, yep. a, a, anything can happen. Just think about this year, Ali. At the beginning of the year, it was not if there'd be a recession, but when and how terrible. And they got it wrong. It was just wrong. There wasn't a recession this year. I also think that all that talking and forecasting of recessions might be one of the reasons why people feel so lousy about the economy now, mm -hmm. even though we didn't have one.